Hi guys and welcome back. In the last video, we talked about how to get our user data and then present it to them in dynamic pages. In order to do that, we stored all their transactions in a Python list, but we talked about the problem that that had, which is as soon as you stop your app, the data in the Python code gets deleted, lost permanently. So it's obviously not a good choice in order to you know, have a fully dynamic website. So in this video, let's talk about data storage or how we can keep that data around between app restarts. There are three ways that I normally use to store data using Python. There's text file that you can create, store your data into and read every time you need the data. There's the SQLite file, which is another type of text file basically, but that behaves like a database. And finally, there is the fully fledged database option. Let's talk about them in turn. What are the benefits and the drawbacks of each option? The first option is the text file. So you can grab your data, you can put it into a text file. Whenever the user adds a new transaction, we change the contents of the text file. And whenever the user wants to look at the transactions, we simply load the text file contents and show it to them in a nice way. This has benefits. The first one and the most important one is that it's really easy to use a text file. In Python, you just import the JSON module and you do json.dump and there you've got yourself a JSON file, you do json.load and you've got the text file contents ready for you to use as a dictionary. Because it's so easy, it is a good idea to use these files for single computer situations. So for example, let's say you're making a Python app, you're packaging it as an executable and you want to give it to your users for them to run in their own computers. You can use a file because you know that only one person is going to be changing the file at a given time. Files don't do well with two people trying to write to them at the same time. So that's why files are good for single user, single computer situations, not so good for multiple computers. So in Flask applications where we've normally got multiple people trying to make their own changes at the same time, files are probably not the way to go. So let's talk about the second option, which is the SQLite file. SQLite is a database and it stores all its contents in a file that sits there beside your code. So it has a couple of small problems and a couple of benefits. The benefits first when compared to JSON files is that because SQLite is a fully fledged database, it can cope with multiple people trying to write to it at the same time. It won't crash. However, SQLite is very slow when it comes to dealing with multiple people writing to it at the same time. So if you have two users trying to write at the same time, SQLite only allows one of them to write first. You have to wait until he finishes or they finish, and then the second person can write their changes. So if you have a lot of users, SQLite can become quite slow quite quickly. However, SQLite is very fast for reading. So if you have a lot of users all trying to read their data from the database, SQLite can cope with that no problem. Now, both text files and SQLite have a common issue, which is that they are files that sit there beside your code. So it's really easy to lose the files. For example, if you overwrite them by accident, or if you delete them by accident, or maybe you download a new version of your code that contains a different data file that doesn't have all the latest content, it's very easy to sort of lose data that you've already got from users. And that's never a good thing. So files are a little bit more fragile in that way. Also because both SQLite and text files are just files sitting there beside your code. If you have this situation where you've got your Flask app deployed into multiple computers so that thousands of people can access them, for example, then each of those multiple computers is going to have their own version of the file and they're not going to be able to share data very easily. So that is definitely another drawback. So let's talk about the solution that is least bad, I guess, which is the database, the fully fledged database. For example, let's say you want to use PostgreSQL, which is a free open source database that is extremely powerful. PostgreSQL is a complete package, which means that you deploy it in its own server normally, and you open it up to connections from other servers so that they can connect to it and read or write data. Because it is deployed independently, multiple servers can access it and they don't have to worry about having different versions of the same data. Also, because PostgreSQL is made for this, multiple servers can write data at the same time without a problem. And of course, multiple servers can read data as well. So what is the problem? 
Well, it's not free most of the time. If you want a managed solution, which means you don't have to install it, update it, maintain it, handle security, etc., then that's normally not going to be free. You have to pay for that. Of course, if you want it, you can do it yourself and then you have to take care of all those things, but that's much more difficult. And so I normally don't recommend that unless you really know what you're doing. All right, so those are the three main options when dealing with data in really any Python app. Let's take a look at how we can use PostgreSQL in our Python app that we've developed here to store our users' transactions. In order to do this, we're gonna make use of PsychoPG2 as well as Flask. So PsychoPG2 is a library that allows us to interact with PostgreSQL. And we're also going to use a managed PostgreSQL installation called Elephant SQL, which has a free tier that we can use, which is very generous. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up Elephant SQL, and then we're going to go and change our code to use it instead of saving things to a Python list. Let's get to it. All right, so here's elephantsql.com. If you go to login, you can create your account and then you'll be in the dashboard. When you get to the dashboard, you'll see something like this. Here I've got a bunch of databases, but you're not gonna have any, but you can go ahead and create a new instance up here and you don't even have to provide your credit card. So this can be, for example, Flash Tutorial for Beginners. Make sure to keep the Tiny Turtle plan there, which is the free plan. And then you can just go ahead and select a region. In the region, you want to select the one that is closest to you. That's fine. Doesn't matter if it's GCP or Amazon or, or whatever. And that's it. Then we can go ahead and create it. And we have our uh, Flash Tutorial for Beginners database there. So we can click on it. And then you'll see that you've got a bunch of details. We're going to need this URL there. So just remember it. <laughs> just, just memorize it. Um, just copy that and we're going to need that in our code in just a moment. Something important about this URL is that it lets you connect to your database. So obviously you don't want to share this with anybody, otherwise they'll be able to connect to your database and delete stuff from it. So let's copy that and go over to our code. So here we've got our code and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, save that in here somewhere. So it's going to be uh, PostgreSQL URI is going to be this. Okay, so we're just going to keep it there for now. What we need to do next is we have to go ahead and install psychopg 2 binary So make sure to go into your terminal, activate your virtual environment, and then do pip install psychopg 2 binary Okay, that's it installed. If you have any problems, then do ask a question in the comments. We'll try to help you out. Once that's installed, we can now do import psychopg 2 from here. And now what we want to do is we want to add a transaction to our database and read the transactions from our database when we need them. So in order to add a transaction to the database, the first thing we have to do is we have to create a table of data. So what we'll do is we'll say connection is psychopg2.connect and we'll pass in the PostgreSQL URI, which I've misspelled, but there we go. So that's going to connect to the database. And then we can do with connection, with connection.cursor as cursor. And here we do cursor.execute and we'll create table transactions. And then inside brackets, we're going to pass in the different columns for our table. We need the date, the amount, and the account. So that's going to be date, text, amount, real, account, text, just like that. So here we've written our first SQL statement. This one creates a table and then it has three columns. If you want to learn more about SQL, we've got actually a complete SQL ebook that you can read and it's going to be linked in the description below. Now that we've got that there, we can go ahead and add a transaction to this table when we receive form data. So again, we'll do with connection and then with connection.cursor as cursor and we'll do cursor.execute and now we're going to do insert into transactions values and then we're going to pass in the three values from our transaction. What we have to do is put percent %s, percent %s, percent %s and then each of these is going to be replaced by a value in the tuple that we pass in as the second argument. So the second argument to connection.execute has to be a tuple of values. Fortunately, we've got it right there. So I'm just going to grab that, put it in there, and there we have it. That is going to take care of inserting the data. 
Now, as soon as I save, this is going to get reformatted into a slightly more readable set of lines. The first one here is the query, and then we've got our tuple there. So each value in this tuple is going to go into one of these columns there. And of course, each one of these values is going to one of the columns in the table. Now we can get rid of the transactions list at the top. And what we have to do down here before we show the transactions is once again with connection, with connection.cursor as cursor, we're going to run a query that will give us the transactions. So we'll do cursor.execute, select star from transactions, and now we'll do transactions equal cursor.fetch all. And that is going to get all the rows from our table and it's going to put them into a transactions list. Let's go ahead and run this. We still have a small improvement to make, but we're going to do flask run. And there we've got this here. We're going to add a transaction and you can see that we got it there. Now we can go back into here, Elephant SQL, go to the browser and see if we can select start from transactions, see if it's in here. We'll execute. And you can see that we've got date, amount, and account in there. So now when we go to slash transactions, you can see we've got that in here because we've read it from the database. Now there is a small problem, which is that if I stop this app and I start it again, we're going to get an error. That's because our app is always trying to create this transactions table, but obviously the table already exists. So all we have to do in here is say, try to do this. And if it fails, then do nothing. And that's that. This is really everything we have to do. So now we can start this again and it's going to try to create a table. It's going to get an error, but it's not going to do anything with that error. And we can continue with our app. This is a bit of a crude way of setting up the relationship with the database, but nonetheless, it'll work. And it gives you a bit of insight into how to handle this database interaction. Now, something else that you don't want to do is you don't want to share this code here with anybody because it contains your PostgreSQL URI, which allows people to connect to your database. So you do want to keep this private. And there's a few different ways of doing that. The first one is using a .env file, but we're not going to go into that in this video. It's a bit of a large topic. If you want to learn more about it, the ebook that we've got linked in the description also talks about that as well. Finally, you might also wonder what the with connection and with connection dot cursor is really doing. It has to do with transactions and it's a bit of a long topic, which is covered in the ebook as well. We're not going to get into it in this video. If you want to learn more about that, check the link in the description. All right, we've reached the end of this Flask tutorial for beginner series. More Flask videos will be coming later on, but not as part of this series. The plan for this series was to show you the most important concepts when doing web development with Flask so that you know how to go and learn more and also sort of how the pieces fit together. So hopefully we've achieved that. Hopefully you feel a bit more comfortable now with doing web development using Flask and how to go and learn more stuff. I would be thrilled if you want to check out my complete Python web course. It's a course that I designed to teach you everything you need to know about web development with Flask, HTML and CSS. And it takes you through the entire knowledge you need, as well as building a bunch of projects using that knowledge. So if you want that practice and that complete experience, then please check out the course, which is linked in the description. And it also really helps me out as well. As usual, thank you so much for joining me in this video. Thank you for watching. Hit like if you liked it and consider subscribing as well. And I'll see you in the next one.